This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon with Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. The comedy drama The Holdovers, reuniting Sideways director Alexander Payne with Paul Giamatti. A biopic about swimmer Diana Nyad with Annette Bening and Jodie Foster, plus May December, starring Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rosen and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly Critic Roundtable show where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me are Bill Bergoli from WSYR and Roger Friedman from showbiz411.com. Let's start out with a look at several new films and limited series in theaters and or streaming, beginning with a new movie called Nyad, about real-life long-distance swimmer Diana Nyad, who tries to achieve the near impossible. Let's take a look at a clip. I want to do it. Do what? Cuba to Florida. My swim. Huh? <laughs> You're hilarious, sir. No, I'm not kidding, Bonnie. I'm going to do it. No, I mean, that's insane. You, you, you tried that when you were 28, and you did not make it when you are 28. You're 60. Yeah, I don't believe in imposed limitations. I don't believe in any limitations. And that's the reason to do it, not the other way around. Bill, tell us about Nyad. Nyad's based on the true story of endurance swimmer Diana Nyad. Now, she broke some records back in the 1970s, then quit, decided to work for ABC Sports, but when she got to be around 60 years old, decided she was going to swim from Cuba to Florida, something she tried to do earlier, but failed. She tried to do it like when she was in her 20s and failed. And what's cool about this, it's directed by two people, uh, Jimmy Chin and Elizabeth Vassahelyi. They're documentary filmmakers. They made Free Solo and won an Oscar for it a few years ago. So what do you think of the film? Well, this is their first narrative film, and actually, as sports films go, it doesn't break any new ground. What's the best thing about it is the performances. Uh, Annette Bening turns a cranky, nasty character into someone that you root for by the end of the movie. And Jodie Foster, we haven't seen her in a long time. She's great as her friend and almost steals a lot of the scenes. Also, Reese Fons, the Welsh actor, does a great American accent he does. playing a world-weary navigator. And what's cool about the film is they let you know that endurance swimming isn't just one person. It takes a whole team of people to pull this off. I actually thought that the, the swimming scenes were very exciting. Yeah. And uh, just like Free Solo, very realistic. And I loved the performances. Annette Bening does a lot with Diana Nyad, who's not a, a nice character. Uh, and Jodie Foster sort of, for once, has a lot of humor in her character. Usually she's very grim. Yeah. Something bad is always happening to Jodie Foster in a movie, and this time she's just a lot of fun and really helps the movie along. And I, I think it's a terrific film. Yeah, I love the film. First of all, I think it's the kind of movie, I mean, I saw it on a big screen in the you theater. You have to see it on a big screen. Right, I mean, you're like immersed, you're like in the water with her. I, I think you would lose some of that if you see it streaming. Yeah. And um, I agree with you on Reese Ifans. I mean, uh, you know, he, he's like, he's funny and yeah. he's great. But if this is really a net betting show, as good as Jodie Foster is in this, I mean, she really, I mean, I think she should possibly, I, I'm sure she'll get an Academy Award nomination. She's been nominated four times. She might even win. She should win, actually, yeah. this year. But, um, I mean, she's like transforms herself into this person. I mean, she does six attempts to, you know, go do the impot facing sharks and jellyfish and stingrays and man of wars. And I mean, she's relentless, you know, and, and, and you know, she, you know, at 25 years old, she's got some notoriety for swimming around Manhattan Island in New York. But this is crazy. I mean, it's a 50 hour swim. And, and many uh, attempts to do it. Yeah, and I mean, and she's hallucinating, you know, like 40 hours into this thing. Yeah. And like a fish, you know, you know, if you touch her, she's disqualified. So they're like a seal. They're like dropping the food <laughs> in, 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 into her mouth, you know. So it's, it's a great film. I think it'll be nominated for Best Picture, yeah. and uh, I, I highly recommend it. Next up is the comic drama The Holdovers, which reunites director Alexander Payne with actor Paul Giamatti, and they did Sideways together. The time is 1970. And the place is a stuffy New England boarding school. Giamatti plays an ancient history teacher who's despised by all of his students for his strictness and for his lack of any sort of compassion. He also, by the way, hates all of them. When Christmas break comes, he's left with the unwanted task of babysitting five teens who, for various reasons, can't be picked up by their parents 
and are stuck at the school for the holidays. Now, instead of feeling sorry for these students and possibly getting into the holiday spirit by making things better for these kids who can't go home, Giamatti makes things worse. He assigns them tough schoolwork and sets up even stricter rules. Now, if you think this ultimately becomes a warm and fuzzy holiday movie or something like Dead Poet Society, it's not. It's an Alexander Payne film filled with dry wit and dark comedy. Giamatti is great here. So is newcomer Dominic Sessa as a lone troubled student, plus Divine Joy Randolph is the school's grieving cook, who's also stuck there for Christmas is marvelous. Together, these three fought an odd trio who are stuck together. They were a newly found dysfunctional family, all of whom have major problems of their own. Along the way, we learn why these characters are the way they are, and to give anything else away will spoil things, so I won't. What I will say is, so far, this is my favorite movie of the year. It's not what you'd expect, and it could easily have been a formulaic movie. But Payne surprises you with so many different turns, and in the process, he makes some incisive statements about human nature and loneliness. Ultimately, The Holdovers is touching, and it's such a smart and engaging film on so many levels. I loved it. Roger, what'd you think? I did, too. Uh, and one of the reasons I really loved it is that it's Alexander's, Alexander Payne's homage to movies from the late 60s. This movie is set in 1970, and it has the feel of The Graduate. It has the feel of uh, uh, all those kinds of movies that were set in schools like Love Story. And he even uses a kind of a Simon and Garfunkel track, uh, some of the same shots. And you get that whole kind of moody loneliness, the melancholy of being at a private school when everyone is gone. And uh, it's a terrifically charming film. Yeah, the kid was great, though. The kid is Where great. Where did they find it? I heard they found this kid in like a theater high school program, Alexander. I, I don't know, but he's terrific. And uh, Divine Joy Randolph is wonderful. And the whole situation among the three of them is so interesting. But Paul Giamatti, who really, I think, should have had Emmy Award after Emmy Award for Billions, uh, will definitely be nominated for Best Actor this year. This is a great performance. Yeah, it's my, as I said, it's my favorite film of the year. He's such a powerful actor. Remember, in Sideways, he basically tanked the sales of Merlot. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's funny. <laughs> Poor winemakers. But uh, he's of this world because he went to a private school. His dad was president of Yale before he became baseball commissioner. Yeah, well, so he knows yeah. this stuff. It's perfect yeah. casting. All right, let's move on. And Roger, um, tell us about... Now, Roger, by the way, um, produced a movie that I love called Only the Strong Survive. Thank you. About all these legends of rock and roll that are still kicking around out there like like yes R&B like Wilson Pickett and Mary Wilson and Sam, Sam, Sam of Sam and Dave so this is right up your alley and why don't you tell everybody about this documentary called Immediate Family. Immediate Family. Well Immediate Family refers to this group uh, that we knew some of us who were of an age uh, knew 50 years ago because uh, these four gentlemen played on um, James Taylor's albums, Carol King's albums, Linda Ronstadt, Jackson Brown, and they became sort of the core musicians. And what's interesting is Denny Tedesco uh, made this movie. He previously made a movie called The Wrecking Crew, which was about uh, Phil Spector's musicians who played on all, literally all 60s. the records from the 60s, yeah. you know, from the fifth dimension to all kinds the of monkeys, monkeys, everybody, <laughs> every hit on the radio. And as as they not faded out, but as they transitioned, uh, these guys came in and it's Leland Sklar, Russ Kunkel, Danny Korchmar. Um, Why do you walk tell? Why do you walk tell? Right. And uh, they're still together. And now they call themselves as, as a group. The immediate family. They they were called during that day the section, and uh, we learn in the movie, first of all, how they met. Then they ha how they met James Taylor through the great Peter Asher, who everyone met in rock and roll, and uh, and then they go on to discuss how they made each of these albums: Tapestry, Sweet Baby James, Linda Ronstadt's Heart Like a Wheel, and uh, you know they were ubiquitous uh, for many many years, and they and. Even after they had their first like decade of tremendous hits together, they're still called upon all the time as uh, experts. So if you if you want to get someone, as they say, now people want to get someone who sounds like them. But it used to be get me that guy. What's interesting is prior to around 1970, musicians' names were not listed on ago, albums. There weren't even, except for Sgt. Pepper, there were never lyrics either. 
So starting with these guys, because they were so amazing, on the James Taylor, first two James Taylor albums and Carole King's Tapestry, they started to list them under every song, saying what they did, and it made them stars, so it became very important. You don't know who plays on a Taylor Swift or Harry Styles record now, and nobody really cares, but these were the guys, <laughs> these were the guys, and they were very trained. They were not, you know, fly-by-night musicians. They were extremely well-trained. Bill, I only have one bone to pick with this, but you produced one of these films, yes. so, you know, they all seem kind of the same, though. You're right. Yeah. A, a lot of these, but... You, you could edit of, them all to one huge film. You could. And it's kind of fun to see these guys play what they played. Yes, isn't it now. great? Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. The most interesting thing to me is, is how all of these songs like make up the soundtrack of, well, so many people's lives, myself included. And listening, watching this movie and listening to all the songs, I mean, the, the prolific nature of these guys. I mean, I'm like, oh, my God, they played... On River of Dreams, the Billy Joel song. I mean, yeah. the Hall and Oates, Rich Girl. I mean, and it just goes on and on and on. And as you said, Warren Zevon, you know, um, Werewolves of London. They, they they did a nine hour session on that one song. They wound up taking the second take. Yes. And um, was it the Wat Wadi Wachtel uh, with Steve Perry on Oh Sherry? Yes. Like he wanted to put horns in, and, and the guy goes, Wadi Wachtel goes, no, you want a guitar solo, and now that's like this. And now it's a famous guitar solo. It's not. Yeah, it's not only an education, but it's interesting and fun. And I'm glad that these guys are, you they know, certainly get their due, they're finally which is getting nice. their due. Listen, it's an outstanding documentary for music fans, you know, of, of this era. Kills of the Flower Moon is director Martin Scorsese's historical drama set in 1920s Oklahoma and starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. Let's take a look at a clip. This supposed to be a suicide, you dumb bell. You didn't tell him to leave the gun. I don't know why I told him to leave the gun. I told him exactly to leave the gun. Just like you told him, kid. I don't know why he did it. I don't know why. I told him just like you told him. You told him to do it in the front of the head, and why did he do it in the back of the head? It's so simple. The front is the front, the back is the back. Man, he has to make it look like he done himself. It just looks like murder. It's not supposed to be that way. You hear? I told him the front of the head. I said the front of the head, just like this, just like you told me. I, I promise you, I promise you, I swear on my children. No, 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 no. no I swear on my children, no, no. King. Roger, my friend, take it away. Talk to me about Killers of the Flower Moon. Okay, I, I, I'll start by saying I think it's an extraordinary film, and that in a year where we've had very good films, this might be the best one. In Oklahoma, uh, the Osage Indians had been uh, buying up land that nobody wanted. And then it turned out the land had oil on it. And because of that, and as the movie shows at the beginning, suddenly the Osage people are wearing fur coats and huge pearls, and they're driving Rolls Royces. And the white people in their town start to look at them and say, what is going on here? Why do they have this? We have to get this money from them. So they, one man, William Hale, who's played so brilliantly by Robert De Niro, decides that he's going to start killing off these people to get their money. And it's a frightening thing. This really happened. And so his nephew, William Hale's nephew, came to work for him. And Leonardo William Hale's, DiCaprio. and that's Leonardo DiCaprio. And William Hale says to his nephew, uh, I'd like you to marry this Osage woman. And if you marry her, we're going to start killing off members of her family so that she inherits everything. And eventually we'll kill off her and you'll inherit everything. And this is Leonardo DiCaprio's maybe best performance ever in a pretty great career. Well, do I disagree, but keep All going. Right. Keep I, go, keep I going. have to tell you, I found, going, it I found it absolutely remarkable. Um, and this... Uh, Lily Gladstone? Uh, Lily Gladstone is a Native American actress who's actually been in quite a few things. It's not... This isn't her first role. But she is luminous in this movie, playing the woman that Leo is assigned to marry, and then tries to kill during the movie by poisoning her uh, and in between while she's being poisoned and she sees all her relatives being killed and little by little as they're being killed she's inheriting their estates she actually goes to Washington and speaks to President Calvin Coolidge and says can you help us and initially it seems like she's being ignored but as the movie progresses uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who then was not a corrupted official and was starting and was just beginning the FBI, uh, came to their rescue to investigate what was happening. Uh, I don't want to give away the punchlines because there are many of them. And then, in addition to telling the story, 
and it's a long story. It's three and a half hours. There's never. It's long. Oh no, I disagree. <laughs> oh, and God, I, it's so long. I say there isn't a minute where you. Somebody said yesterday on social media. They said, "I'll tell you when the bathroom breaks are in Killers of the Flower Moon." There are none, mm -hmm. because the movie is so compelling that you can never leave because you don't know what's going to happen next, yeah. and that's really true. Yeah, but by the time you leave the theater, your picture's on milk cartons. That's how old this is. <laughs> That's, That's how right. long is it? I feel like if you go, I always felt with, this way with Scorsese, and I felt this way with Oppenheimer. If you're going to the movies, you're going to the movies. If you're committing to this period of time to see something, it doesn't matter how long it is. Bill, what's your opinion? Well, I've read movie? the book it's based on by David Grant. So have I. Yeah, and the FBI part of the movie moves really quickly. In the book, it's a lot bigger. It's an interesting performance from DiCaprio because he usually plays these pretty bright guys. He played Howard Hughes, that sort yeah. of thing. In this movie, this is my uh, impression of him in this movie. Yes, he does. He does that a lot. He does that a lot, but also, I think it's sort of cool for him that yeah. he does that because instead of being a know-it-all, he sort of knows nothing. And you loved the movie. I loved it. Yeah. Unbelievable. Okay, well, here's, here you go. <laughs> At three and a half hours, I think it's way too long. And I did not read the book. But um, I say, Marty, if you want to do a three and a half hour movie, um, it's going to be on Apple TV Plus. Do two parts and do like a limited series or something like that. Um, I was bored in the movie. I mean, you know, I think you could have easily, easily cut an hour and a half out of this movie. An hour, at, at, no. an hour and a half in, I said to myself, this, I got two more. I have two more hours of this movie. It's crazy. I will give you some positive things. OK, I think Lily Gladstone is terrific. I think that the costumes and the sets were superb. You know, I went with, I, I took a guest, and he said, Neil, if, you, if I wasn't with your guest, I would have walked out after 40 minutes. So, you know, I think it's an important story, but it is just draggy and slow, you well, know. Well, your guests disagree with you. Okay, there you go. All right, Bill, mm. tell us about May, December, not the months of the year, but it's the name of a movie. That's right, Julian Moore, she stars as Gracie. She's a 60-something-year-old uh, woman who, when she was in her 30s, had an affair with a 13-year-old boy in the stockroom of a pet store. Years later, they're married, they've got kids all going off to college, and who shows up but Natalie Portman, playing an actress named Elizabeth, who's going to play Gracie in a movie. And things get awkward right away. <laughs> she probes and probes and realizes that the marriage between Gracie and Joe, the 13-year-old who's grown up, is not what it seems to be. They're trying to make things look nicer than it really are. And you realize that Natalie Portman's character has a shady side, too. Uh, she's a mess. She, she certainly <laughs> is. She screws up all their lives. Yeah, she makes, uh, she makes a mess of things. Uh, it's directed by Todd Haynes, who loves probing the soft white underbelly of suburban America. Uh, and he uses some old-fashioned Hollywood tricks. That soundtrack, bum, 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 yeah. was really corny. A lot of shots where uh, there were mirrors on the set, yes. that sort of thing. He loves that kind of stuff. But at the end, I didn't know quite what to make of it all. The ending was kind of weird. It was kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. What I wanted to know was, they live in the most beautiful it's house, the and yet nobody seems to be working. Yeah. Uh, he has a job as like an x-ray tech, tech yeah. at the hospital. My sister's an x-ray tech. She doesn't have a house Well, there's like an that. answer to that. She does. They, they sold this story to a tabloid. Did and you see that in the movie? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I well, you know, it's, ba it it's oh, based okay. on it, it, the inspiration for this is the 90s tabloid story about Ma with Mary Kay Letourneau, uh -huh. is that her name? Yeah. Right, who had sex with a 13-year-old student. She was the teacher. Yes. And Todd Haynes uses that as a template, changes it, as Bill said, to a pet store, and just, you know, kind of like fictionalizes a lot of this stuff. But you're right, they don't mention that in the movie. No, and actually, I will tell you that after I saw the movie, I ran into Julianne Moore, and I said that exact thing to her, how do these people afford the house? She said, oh, it's mentioned in the movie. So I had to go back and watch it again to see, but they don't mention it. Nah. It's understood. I don't know. I'm not a big Todd Haynes fan. I have to tell oh, you. Oh, he's done some great I, films. I'm not a fan of Carol. I'm not a fan of Far From Heaven. Oh, it's Far safe. From Heaven's a great and movie. I liked some of the Dylan portrayals in I'm Not There, yeah. but <laughs> not all of them. But like those movies to me, again, you know, going back to Killers of the Flower Moon, I, I, I was, I, it was dull to me. I was not 
the, the subject matter here was, you had such potential to make a dark satirical comedy, an interesting limited series, and I think it's a lot of missed opportunity. I mean, the guy who plays the th now 20 years later. Charles Melton. Yeah, Charles Melton. They're married. I just couldn't get involved. I think it's dull, unengaging, and uninvolving. You know, I don't know. Do, do you do you feel similarly? Uh, I'm not uh, so vociferous about it. I was I was <laughs> I was certainly interested in what was happening, and the situation, and I found the acting very good. Yeah. The, well, look, now, these are great actors. You know, but I, again, they're dif they they don't they, it's a they, difficult story. they elevate the material, but the material needs a lot more elevation. You know, it, it's explosive. It's an explosive subject, and I think it was mishandled. Why are you in Wilmington, North Carolina? Because I believe in your son. I believe he's different. And I believe you might be the only person on earth who knows it. That's why I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina. All right, Mr. Picaro, thank you for coming. That was a clip from the film Air. It's Roger Friedman's personal choice as we go around the panel with our Critics' Picks of the Month. Roger. Okay. Did you ever think there'd be a movie about the making of sneakers? <laughs> but, but this is one of the best movies of the year. It's in my top ten for the, uh, 2023, without a doubt. Ben Affleck directed it. Matt Damon stars in it with a big cast of well-known actors like Jason Bateman. Uh, terrific people, and Viola Davis steals the movie as Michael Jordan's mother. The whole idea of this movie is tells the story in 1984 of how uh, Nike wanted to become a bigger shoe company by getting a celebrity sponsor, someone to come in and talk for them. At that time, hard to believe if you're alive today, that Converse and Adidas were the sneakers everyone wore. <laughs> Nike was something nobody knew about. And this guy, Tony, uh, Sonny Vaccaro, who's played be beautifully by Matt Damon, uh, persuades uh, Michael Jordan and his family to sign with Nike. And at the same time, uh, Ben Affleck, who plays Phil Knight, and his group of people, including Jason Bateman and a bunch of other terrific actors, are developing the shoe that's going to become the Air Jordan. And you would think when you first heard this as an idea, well, that, who wants to see a movie about that? It's, a, it's so well made and so well written, and the casting is so perfect. Uh, they definitely deserve a SAG Ensemble nomination because that's an ensemble mm. uh, you'll never forget. It's a great movie, and I'm telling you, the writing is specifically perfect so that it becomes a thriller about how they persuade Michael Jordan to do this, and at the same time, how they develop the sneaker that he's going to wear. And as the two things come together, it's really kind of a classic screenplay. <laughs> What's your pick, Bill? It's called Our Flag Means Death. This show is on Max, and it is to piracy what F Troop was to the cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> it's based on a true story. A, a real guy named uh, Steed Bonnet in 1717. He was a wealthy landowner in uh, Great Britain, and he decided to give up his cushy life and become a pirate. He's played here by a guy named uh, Riss Darby, who is in What We Do in the Shadows. And eventually, he meets up with Blackbeard, another pirate who really existed. And he's played by Taika Waititi. Believe it or not, a romance <laughs> eventually I, happens. I, yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, there's gender bending. Between whom? Between Steed and Blackbeard. Yes. Although Blackbeard says, call me Ed. <laughs> I and they're why. very flirty. Yeah, in, in a lot of flirty. There's a lot of gender flirty. bending. Do not watch this with kids. The language is really raw. Uh, Blackbeard is like, yeah, the Blackbeard and, the, and this gentleman pirate guy have... But the, the first R-rated movie I ever sneaked into was Blackbeard with Richard Burton. Ah. And this is a different kind of had, Blackbeard. He had no <laughs> homosexual tendencies in that movie. Well... He was with Joey Heatherton. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, you can see why. There you go. Uh, Believe it or not, Minnie Driver shows up in this uh, second season, and she plays a real-life uh, lesbian pirate named Anne Bonny. Uh, pirates are interesting. Pirates, I'll have you know, were very democratic. And in this show, they're always putting everything they do to a vote. There's a lot of real pirates. They actually uh, paid attention when they make this comedy. 
My pick is the HBO series The Gilded Age, which was created, written, and directed by Downton Abbey's Julian Fellows. It takes place in the late 1880s, which was a turning point for high society in New York, both architecturally and socially. The story revolves around the Russells, an extremely wealthy new money family, loosely based on the Vanderbilts, who are desperately trying and maneuvering to get accepted into old money New York society, where Mrs. Astor, who resists change, holds the keys. Series blends historical fact with fiction, and the absorbing stories involve romance and wheeling and dealing amongst the upper class socialites, the trials and tribulations of their domestic workers, as well as the struggles of African American upper class in New York. The period costumes are eye popping, and so are the sets, including their opulent mansions and the old time Manhattan streets, which are painstakingly recreated. Christine Baranski, Cynthia Nixon, Carrie Coon, and Nathan Lane are among the excellent cast. And for lovers of New York City history from a bygone era, it's fun, educational, involving, and overall, it's a real treat. I loved the first season, and I've just seen the entire second season, which recently debuted, and in my opinion, it's just as good. Well, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank Bill Brigoli and Roger Friedman. I'm Neil Rosen. Join us next time on Talking Pictures. <laughs>